What's up, YouTube? So I want to come through and share 10 extremely relevant Malcolm X quotes with you guys. Of course, there are many more Malcolm X quotes that are extremely rele relevant to today. But, you know, unfortunately, I just don't have the time to go through all of them, you know. Um, so instead, I just narrowed it down to the, you know, in my personal opinion, just, you know, the 10 most relevant quotes to today as far as, you know, us as black people. Um, so, you know, with that being said, let's just get into it. All right. The first quote. All right. Here we go. The media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power. Really, it should be it has the power, but um, they have the power to make the innocent guilty and to make the guilty innocent. And that's power because they control the minds of the masses. And I definitely agree with Malcolm. Um, the media is powerful, right? And what he's saying is true. Like the media can put out all these images and sometimes like with us as black people, it kind of makes us look like we're like the aggressors and like, we are the problem when no we're just actually just responding to aggression right we're responding to the problems that you know mainstream white folks well white people but also like the mainstream media that's how they tend to frame it though right you know also we don't have much control over our media image think about that we really don't um, we have a little more control over our media image than in the past, but still, we don't really have much control over that. And that's a problem as well. Many of us will play into our media image stereotypes with no hesitation just for a nice payoff. And sometimes not even a good payoff. It's just like they just play, paying into it, uh, playing into it just because, you know, uh, coons for play. Are coons for pay one of the two <laughs> you know uh, let's move on to the next quote uh, this is the second one this is one this one's a good one too well there are they all are good ones but you know what I mean if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches there's no progress if you pull it out if you pull it all the way out that's not progress Progress is healing the wound that the blow made. And they haven't even pulled the knife out, much less healed the wound. They won't even admit the knife is there. <laughs> so, you know, of course, this is Malcolm X sort of referring to like, you know, what we as black people have gone through as far as like, you know, the effects of slavery and also the effects of Jim Crow, too. You know, and I believe, you know, this is very true, you know, and I think that, you know, there are not really any laws on the books, not really, that really addresses, you know, helping to heal the wounds of slavery and Jim Crow, you know, um, obviously not the psychological wounds, but I'm talking about more so the economic wounds, right? You know, obviously we can't really expect for them to heal us psychologically and spiritually of course and as well I think that's something that we kind of need to do on our own you know and as well it took forever for America to apologize for slavery let alone really fix anything you know but there's an era of American history that is often overlooked this is a bit of a sidebar but I'm gonna go on it you know I'm gonna make it quick though but there's an era of, the, of American history that's often overlooked, and that is the Reconstruction Era. That is a very significant era for black people because, and also, also um, just the country, because we, you know, the country was essentially reconstructing itself after the Civil War, right? And black people were experiencing freedom in the Americas, well, the United States, for the first time you know, as a group of people, you know. But during that era, black people owned a lot of land. Black people also um, 
where uh, politicians had political power as well, you know, as well, even had, um, you know, successful businesses of some sort. You know, there was a lot of prosperity during that time for black people, right? And that was post-slavery, but pre-Jim Crow, all right? That is very significant, right? But, you know, you know, organizations like, you know, the uh, police, the Ku Klux Klan, and... Um, uh, the media, the school systems, like all these entities in America came together in smashing that effort that black people were making. Okay? So sometimes it does come off as if, oh, you know, black people have never really tried to do anything or have never really tried to build anything, which is not true. That's not true. Black people have. But unfortunately, White people have also, when they've seen that, they've gotten basically in their feelings about it because they see black people are often uh, surpassing them and they feel some type of a way about that because they've been fed and brainwashed that they are superior. So if someone is inferior to you and you're the superior one and you're looking at them and you're like, wait a minute, why don't I have what they have, right? They feel threatened by that. You know, they felt even envious of that. And of course, this era isn't really talked about that much. Notice, in, have you really heard about this in like your history classes or any sort? Whether it was in grade school or in college, you don't really hear about that that much, the Reconstruction era. You may, if you have taken like an African-American history course, you probably will hear about that, but not in like your general American history course though. So yeah, I just wanted to go on that sidebar um, right quick and just put it out there, right? Because sometimes I think we do think like, oh, we just dumb niggas. We just ain't did shit. We ain't shit. We ain't about shit. We ain't gonna never be shit, you know? And that's not true, you know? That's just not exactly... If you go by history, that's not how it really played out, right? And as well, there was black people who have, you know, went to, you know, Canada and started communities there. Uh, black people who have um, went to Liberia and started communities there, you know, went back to Africa, right? It's just, you know, it's a lot more to the story than the mainstream media and the educational system will lead you to believe, Okay. All right, but let's move on to the next quote. All right, so this is the third quote here. All right, here we go. Quote, unquote. If Martin Luther King, Roy Wilkins, and any of these compromising Negroes who say exactly what the white man wants to hear is interviewed anywhere in the country, you don't get anybody to offset what they say. But whenever a black man stands up and says something that white people don't like, then the first thing that man does is run around to try and find somebody to say something to offset what has just been said. This is natural, but it is done. Yes, yes, that is completely true. Case in point, y'all don't know about the whole Colin Kaepernick situation, right? You know, when he did the, you know, silent uh, protest against police brutality. You notice the mainstream media interviewed and asked many black people and non-black people their opinions about the protests, right? In an effort to offset what Colin Kaepernick was protesting, right? Notice that, right? But on the other hand, right, on the other hand, When Lil Wayne said he didn't feel connected to Black Lives Matter and that, quote unquote, I have never dealt with racism, did the mainstream media try to counter that? No. If anything, they pushed what Lil Wayne said throughout the media. They were pushing that story. 
So you got, again, back to the media, you got to be really cautious of the media and how it really plays a role in our day-to-day -day lives and how we view situations, how we view people and groups of people. Again, be very cognizant, all right? All right, so next quote. And I believe this is uh, quote number four. Here we go. Quote, unquote, there can be no black, white unity until there is first some black unity. We cannot think of uniting with others until we have first united amongst ourselves. We cannot think of being acceptable to others until we have first proven acceptable to ourselves. And I'll say that I completely agree. We as a people are too damaged, honestly, to be uniting and integrating with other races and groups of people. We really are. We have not had any sort of therapy or healing, and we need that. We really do. It may not seem like it on the surface, but when you start really digging into this, you really start to unravel is some of just the psychological and spiritual damage that we have gone through, you know? And it's it's just, it's really terrible, you know? You know, we have never been amongst ourselves, like, and healed. We really haven't. And that I think that's kind of like what we should have done if we were going, if integration was going to happen, I think that should have happened before we integrated because we, in yeah, I'll get into that later. But because there was no healing process at all for black people, you know, we're kind of like damaged people in a system that is against us. And that's not a good thing because we're already damaged, plus we're getting damaged more from the system. It's just not conducive to, you know, good mental health and good spiritual health. Yeah. But the damage is done. All right. And also, um, shout out to Dr. Joy DeGruy. I think DeGruy. Actually, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce her last name, but she goes into depth about this, actually, um, in her lectures and in her books, too, about kind of like post-traumatic slavery syndrome and kind of like the healing process and all that good stuff, you know. So, you know, check her out if you're interested in learning more about that. All right. All right. Uh, next. Next quote. And this is the fifth quote, quote number five, all right, quote unquote, do you know what integration really means? It means intermarriage. That's the real point behind it. You can't have it without intermarriage, and that would result in disintegration of both races, all right? So I'll throw a question out there. Why do you think white people would do this? Why do you think white people would kind of allow this to happen? They're in control. They, you know, say what kind of goes on and what doesn't go on. They can write the laws on the books, et cetera, et cetera, right? So why do you think this would be, you know? Honestly, I think this was to prevent black people from rising up, right? And some people are probably like, well, what about white people? They would be affected by this too. You know, a lot of white people are like, no, we don't want this, you know. And also like the disintegration of both races, right? Wouldn't that affect white people too? Yes, you know, it does. But the thing is, this uh, the system of white supremacy, like the power structure is already in place. At this point, they don't really have to do much of anything over because it's, it's self-maintaining at this point. Like the system 
is so much in effect that you don't really have to do much. So like some white people can legitimately say like, oh, you know, I'm not a part of the KKK. You know, I've never, you know, racially discriminated against anyone. And that can all be true, you know. But the way that this system works is they don't have to do that. A lot of them, the, your average white person really doesn't have to do that. So they can benefit from this system because of the way that it's set up and it's structured and it's in place and it's in motion, you know, versus us, we honestly are not, yeah. honestly, I think we probably should have opted for our own system instead. Um, although to be fair, like I've spoken previously, spoken on previous, previously in this video, we have sort of tried to opt for sort of like our own system in a way, you know? Unfortunately, we don't have a way to defend our system. That's kind of like the common denominator, right? We don't have a way to defend ourselves and our system. That's what we kind of need to concentrate on. All right. So next quote. This is quote number six. And this is a really good one. So listen. All right. Quote unquote. It's just like when you've got some coffee that's too black, which means it's too strong. What do you do? You integrate it with cream. You make it weak. But if you pour too much cream in it, you won't even know you ever had coffee. It used to be hot. It becomes cool. It used to be strong. It becomes weak. It used to wake you up. Now, it puts you to sleep. <laughs> I'm like, boy, I tell you, like, Malcolm X was too woke for y'all. He was too woke for the system. That's why they had to get rid of his ass. <laughs> he was too woke for them for this shit. All right, I'm telling you. <clears throat> but didn't integration put us to sleep as a people? And also, this can be applied to race mixing as well. Like, think about it. You know, keep on mixing races, and soon the standard black folks aren't going to really look that much like black folks, you know? Yeah. We'll be lucky if they're looking like beige folks. They're probably going to be looking like white people, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, something to think about. All right. Uh, quote number seven. All right. Now you integration minded Negroes are trying to force yourself onto your former slave master, trying to make him accept you in his drawing room. You want to hang out with his woman rather than the women of your own kind. All right. <laughs> All right. So Malcolm X obviously saw this shit coming from a mile away. Right. He saw this coming from a mile away. Fighting to be with Massa's daughter and son. Why? What do we really get from that? Nothing but confusion, you know, and the disintegration of black people. You know, keep on make, keep on race mixing. Because, you know, like the old school black folks are kind of like more so on this like, oh, you know, kind of like the one drop rule to an extent. And like, you know, I got people in my family like that. Like my mom's one of those people like low key. And, you know, I don't knock my mom. Because that's kind of like the era that she grew up in, you know. Yeah. And honestly, as well, that's kind of like part of the reason, a big chunk of the reason why I kind of am here in existence, you know, and coming at you with this video. And if you really think about it, because, you know, my mom's actually, believe it or not, she's not a swirler. <laughs> my mom's not a swirler. Um, although, you know. Well, I won't get into that, but you know what I mean, though. But, yeah, that's, you know, really something to think about here, you know. All right, uh, next quote. This is quote number eight. Historically, revolutions are bloody. And yes, they are. They haven't never had a bloody or a bloodless revolution or a nonviolent nonviolent revolution that don't happen even in Hollywood. 
You don't have a revolution in which you love your enemy. And you don't have a revolution in which you are begging the system of exploitation to integrate you into it. Revolution overturns the system. Revolutions destroy the system. Right? Bingo. For us as black people, what revolutions have we really done? Black folks in America, what revolutions have we really done? We participated in some revolutions now. We, like, we, we as black folks, we have participated in every single war that America has fought for. All right. We have always been a part of every war. All right. And honestly, I feel like to an extent, you can't have revolution without black people. And I think people know that. Other groups of people, I think they do know that. So, like, you notice how they always kind of try and get black people to support their causes, right? Like the feminists, right? Uh, Native Americans lately, right? Hispanic folks, right? Even some Asian folks, right? Right? All right. <clears throat> but honestly, I think the closest thing that we as black people have had to a revolution that was specifically about us is probably Nat Turner's Rebellion. I think that may be the closest thing on a large scale that black people have had to a revolution. You know, again, we have participated in revolutions and wars, you know, but those revolution and wars were not about us in our situations, right? So, like, you know, we've been in, like, the Civil War, you know, World War One and Two, you know, like, so many, right? But you notice those things never really, like, folks participated in World War One and Two or whatever, you know, black men primarily participated in those and they still kind of had to deal with segregation or, like, discrimination and oppression, Right. Saying you can't live here. You can't um, be here. <clears throat> you know, this, that and the third. Right. So, you know, it's important to kind of be like, OK, we kind of need to be able to get something out of this stuff. And I feel like we do, but it's very minimal, <laughs> you know. Right, let's move on to the next quote. Uh, this quote is uh, number nine. All right. So, quote unquote, <clears throat> people involved in a revolution don't become part of the system. They destroy the system. The Negro revolution is no revolution because it condemns the system and then asks, asks the system it has condemned to accept them. Exactly. Right? Why did we condemn the system, then ask the system to let us in? Isn't that kind of like a mixed message, you know? Because on one hand, like, it's terrible. What you're doing is wrong. Can we can we be a part of it? <laughs> right? right? <clears throat> um, it doesn't really make any sense. Again, why would we want to be a part of a system that we condemn instead of just building our own system? It sends a mixed message to white people and black people. It really does. And it's just like, hmm, you know, like, like, what's up? What's up with this? This is strange. All right. Yeah. So I have one last quote for you guys. All right. So this is quote number 10, quote unquote, the most disrespected woman in America is the black woman. The most unprotected person in America is the black woman. The most neglected, pers neglected person in America is the black woman. Now, I bet you y'all sisters thought I forgot. Yeah, I, I bet you y'all thought I forgot about this quote, didn't you? I bet you was like, nah, he ain't gonna talk about that quote. But yeah, I talked about it. I ain't, you know, I ain't forget about the sisters. But, you know, 
The thing is, though, I don't think this quote is actually very popular. I never see it on any list of like Malcolm X's famous quotes, which really just further proves the validity of the quote. <laughs> and, you know, like this really is kind of valid because it, you can't really find the quote. Okay, you have to specifically search for the quote. You know, you won't just run across it, right? <clears throat> But, you know, why would Malcolm X say something like this? Was Malcolm X, you know, was he just being a simp? <laughs> you know, was Malcolm X just, you know, simping and pandering to black women? Where did this come from? All right now? And also, Malcolm X said this, I believe, in the 60s. We are in 2018. I think this quote is still extremely relevant to today. You know? <clears throat> And it's sad, you know, it's kind of like, has progress progress really been made? In some aspects, yes. In some aspects, no, you know. And it's a little disturbing, really, if you think about it, you know. Also, I kind of, what, what, he had to have seen something that made him say this quote, right? Because this quote didn't just come out of nowhere. I really don't think so. Considering the time era that, you know, that they were in, I really don't think this quote came out of nowhere. But I, I kind of, you know, wonder about some things, you know. I wonder what was Malcolm X's stance on colorism. You know, I wonder what he thought about colorism. You know, I don't think I've been able to really find much of his opinions on colorism. You know, I like I would like to think that he was on the right side of the issue of colorism. Also, did he experience any colorism? Especially kind of like being like a pro-black leader, but also like light and skin tone. You know, did people kind of ever come at him sideways and be like, hey, like, you can't speak for us. You know? I mean, get your half-breed ass out of here. Like, you know, half-white devil, etc. Like, you know... I wonder was that did that ever come up during Malcolm X's time? Yeah. Um, but also, um, I do want to mention, you know, notice the police brutality victims. We tend to know the name of the black men who are victims of police brutality, but we don't tend to really know the names of the black women who are police brutality victims, right? You got Sandra Bland and Corinne Gaines. I give you those two. Who else? Just, you know, right off the, like, right off the bat, right? Versus, like, oh, you know, um, like, Philando Castile, right? Or Freddie Gray, uh, Walter Scott, um, Stephon Clark. You know, and you notice that the media coverage too, right? The media tends to cover those stories more than when it happens to black women, you know? And also, um, I don't know if you guys know, because this case wasn't popular, but this case is really significant for black women. It was a case where this um, Eurasian police officer by the name, I think, Daniel Holtzclaw, he was a police officer, and he was sexually assaulting and raping specifically black women. Black women were specifically his target, right? And in court, he had said something to the extent of, well, you know, no one really cares about them. Is he wrong? And I think that probably played a what played a role and played a factor in why he targeted black women, right? And, you know, that's kind of like the message that I think we as the black community sometimes kind of send. Like, you know, no one really cares about black women. People tend to care about black men, though. <laughs> Um, but uh, Daniel Holtzclaw was convicted of 18 out of 36 of his convictions, and he his penalty 
In his time, he has to serve 263 years in prison. Okay, so pretty much life in prison. All right. So thank God that the jury stepped up and did the right thing in this case. And also, this case received very little media coverage. Very little media coverage, by the way. Um, I don't know why, um, but thankfully, you know, there was some justice served, you know? <clears throat> um, but before I go, I do want to speak on one more thing. Um, when it comes to pro-black leaders, as I mentioned before, it's usually... I think at this point, I don't really think, I think that the era of the true pro-black leaders is gone. I really do. Um, I feel like it's possible, but I just, I don't know. I just don't see it really happening at this point. I think we got people who want to play, play, and pretend to be pro-black leaders, right? And I have a whole nother video about that coming up. You know, I don't know when I'm going to release this video or whatever, but I have a whole nother video about that. Pretty much going into my pro-black leader checklist for, you know, for me personally. All right. <clears throat> but when it comes to pro-black leaders, usually uh, one of three things usually happens. All right. They try to buy you off. All right. They try to cast you off. All right. You know, so they'll probably put you in prison or just exile your ass to like Namibia or some shit. Um, are, you know, they just kill you off. So, you know, usually one of those three things, it's, you know, one of those three things, right? And, you know, there is um, some footage of the FBI trying to bribe Malcolm X, all right? There is footage out there. You can look it up for yourself, all right? The footage is a bit long, you know, and this video is already long enough, so I didn't want to, like, put it in here and make the video even longer, but there is footage out there, though, all right? Malcolm X wouldn't accept it. He wouldn't sell out. You know, like I said, they will buy you off, cast you off, or kill you off. Since they couldn't buy Malcolm X off, since they couldn't put him in jail, cast him off to Namibia, guess what they did? All right. And the pro-black leaders that ain't here, those were the leaders that wouldn't or couldn't be bought off, right? And as well, the pro-black leaders that are not here may be in jail or just be exiled. That happens, too. And again, the pro-black leaders that are here were brought off, right? Like I said, like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, they were killed off. Uh, Marcus Garvey and W.E.B. Du Bois and Huey P. Newton, I believe. Huey P. Newton was put in jail. Um, and Malcolm... Well, Marcus and the boys were exiled, right? And then Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, and Louis Farrakhan were brought off. All right. So that's usually how it goes down for like the people who are really the real, real, real ones, right? Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say. Sorry for this video being on the long side. My bad. But thanks for watching. Please, please, please leave your comments. Um, thanks for watching again. Until the next video, adios and goodbye for now.